What can ancient Greek philosophers tell us about how to live our lives today? It's hard to imagine that anyone living before the 20th century could possibly relate to our modern times. Like, what did your morning look like today? Maybe you're among the 80% of Americans that woke up to the sounds of a city stirring into busyness. You probably pulled your phone into bed to check email, social media, or the news. Maybe you grabbed a banana or toaster strudel as you ran out the door with your belongings. If you're the average American, you spend about 17 minutes driving through traffic before arriving at your job, where you powered up your computer and proceeded to click, type, and scroll through most of your day, on pace to spend 42% of your life looking at a screen. We're often in a constant state of distraction, moving from one thing to the next, one reward to another, rarely ever finding the time to simply be still. And yet, when you look historically, it's like this has always been a problem. I mean, I have a quote in the intro from Blaise Pascal. He's like, all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's true. When did he say that? Like last year? And it's like, <laughs> no, 1500. That's Ryan Holiday, author of the best selling books, Ego is the Enemy and The Obstacle is the Way. His new book is called Stillness is the Key. The interesting thing about stillness is like, it's not something you buy, right? Like, it's not something you go get even. I think. It's something that emerges as you strip other things away. Most of his books pull inspiration from the ancient philosophy of Stoicism. Its teachings provide practical tools that are just as useful today as they were when they were first written on parchment. One of the tools, stillness. Ryan presents examples throughout ancient and modern times where stillness became the greatest source of happiness and breakthrough, and equally how the lack of it can lead to turmoil and distress. From Napoleon to Kennedy to master archers and out-of-the-box composers, Ryan provides countless examples of how history's greatest figures have used stillness to better their work and lives. In this conversation, Ryan and I talk about the paradox of chasing happiness, the importance of creating routines, and how to become more mindful with technology. Why do you think that Stoicism is such a powerful philosophy to live a good life? What could it possibly be about a philosophy that's invented in ancient Greece makes its way to ancient Rome, and then o over 2,000 years, it's used by you know, people in the Renaissance. It's George Washington's favorite philosophy in the American Revolution. It's used by prisoner of war, uh, prisoners of war in Vietnam. It's, it's used by football players recovering from injury. Like, how could something work for so many diverse situations and people? I just find that endlessly fascinating. And I think the answer is that Stoicism isn't some explanation of the universe. It's not this like complicated philosophical theory or abstraction. It's just like really practical life advice. And I mean, I've, I've, one of the Stoke philosophers, his name is Epictetus, and he says like, our, the main job for a philosopher, the first job, is to just separate things into the two buckets, like the ones that you control and the ones that you don't control. He says what's up to us and what's not up to us. And so you can see how whether you're a slave or whether you're leading an army or whether you're an entrepreneur, just going like, hey, this thing that I'm getting upset about, this thing that I'm worried about, this thing that I'm putting time and energy into, ultimately, is it up to me? And so much of the stuff that we spend a lot of time and energy doing is not up to us. Like, think about the sort of the rat race or the the keeping up with the Joneses that motivates so much of the materialism that we do. It's like, you can buy a Lamborghini, but you can't make it impress people. Do you know what I mean? Like, you can, <clears throat> you can accumulate a lot of money and a lot of stuff, but you can't make people respect you. You can't make your parents proud of you. You can't make, you can't do anything with regards to what other people do and think. You can only control your own actions and thoughts, right? And so, the Stoic would say, like, why are you trying to impress people with this fancy, you know, um, you know, house that you bought or, or with the jewelry you wear? Why don't you work instead on, like, not needing to impress people or work on whatever that part of yourself is that thinks, if I impress other people, then I'm worthwhile. And you know what I mean? And so, so it's, it's not about turning inward so much as it's about saying, you know, where does the delineation between the things that I have influence over and the things that I don't, where is that? And then let me just focus all my energy there and not waste time, energy, money on, on doing things that ultimately other people control and are likely to disappoint you on or hurt you on or not recognize. 
in a lot of ways it forces us to ask those questions. Why? And I think your new book is about stillness. And this is something that we get much and much less of these days. Of course. So many of us go to bed looking at our phones, wake up looking at our phones, constantly distracted, constantly having these interruptions throughout our days and not having this moment of stillness. Why do you think stillness is, is so important to people today? Well, it's interesting. It's like, not only do we not have moments of stillness, we don't even have like seconds of stillness, right? And, and like, and yet the stillness we do experience, and it's funny, like, I don't think we need to define stillness because I think everyone knows what it is. It's just one of those words. You're like, yes, not only do you know it, but you remember in your life, incredibly powerful experiences for which that's the only way you could describe them. You know, it's like, walking along a beach, you know, it's the day you got married, it's the, it's uh, that time you got in such a creative flow that you wrote something amazing or when you had that idea for your business, you know, like there, there are these moments we have of stillness that are spectacular and yet they're exceedingly rare. And not, as you said, not only are they rare, it's almost as if the world is conspiring to make them impossible. And yet when you look historically, it's like this has always been a problem. I mean, I have a quote in the intro from Blaise Pascal. He's like, all of man's problems stem from his inability to sit quietly in a room alone. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's true. When did he say that? Like last year? And it's like, <laughs> no, 1500, you know, like, you're like, oh man. And it must have been way easier to sit quietly in a room in 1500. And the idea that Buddha and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and Confucius and Epicurus, all these ancient figures in different cultures, different time periods, different philosophies. We're also saying that, uh, look, our inability to be still uh, is why we're unhappy. And by the way, when we are still, we are happy. So I think what it's about is, is one, let's, let's put a word to it, let's focus on it, let's make it a priority, and then let's try to build a life or lifestyle or a set of priorities that allow it to ensue. I mean, it is a very unique time to be alive, sure. but at the same time, in the span of evolution, human brains haven't evolved that much since these days of the early Stoics. Seneca supposedly had 300 ivory tables. Like imagine, if he, was, he was notorious for his parties. Imagine how many, how much of, of a partier you have to be <laughs> that you own 300 tables for entertaining. Like where would you even put them? <laughs> where would you even put them? And how many, like at a party, not everyone sits down. So like, <laughs> like 300 tables, this is just madness. And so like even in the Stoics, it's not like, like you know, we go, oh, Buddha talked about stillness, but like Buddha's a, you know, he sort of renounces his worldly possessions and he goes and like lives in the wilderness. Like I can't do that. What I think is interesting about Seneca and Marcus Aurelius and the other Stoics is like, they really were real people struggling with this in the real world. So like Seneca has this interesting approach. It's not just like sell all your stuff, have nothing, like, you know, walk the streets without shoes on and, you know, wear worn out clothes. Like Seneca is like one of the richest people in Rome. And, and you can tell he does struggle with some materialism and like having too much stuff. But, you know, he ultimately comes down with, with, with this idea of, okay, so we go like, there's th good things and there's bad things. And then he says, there's things in the middle that are, we're indifferent to. That he says, but maybe there's such a thing as preferred indifference. Indifference, not uh, C-E, but T-S, right? Preferred indifference. And he says, like, money and possessions should be preferred indifference. So he's like, it's better probably to be rich than poor. It's probably better to be tall than short. It's probably better to be handsome than ugly. A, a philosopher, a wise person, should be able to deal with either. But, like, if you do find yourself rich because you sold a company or you won the lottery or you had successful parents or, you know, whatever it is, or, or you happen to, you know, one person picks writing, the other person becomes an NBA player, and these are different pay scales. But if you do have money, if you do have stuff, the idea is not that the stuff is inherently bad and that a philosopher can't own things or can't exist in the world. It's that you can't, it's, it's unphilosophical, it's un- it's, it, it's, it's not stillness to need those things. Do you know what I mean? To like be dependent on them or to be worried about them all the time. So his point was, I have money, I earned it, but uh, you know, it, and I'm gonna enjoy it. But if it went away tomorrow, it wouldn't ruin my life. You have a really interesting story that you talk about 
with Napoleon and, and how he managed inputs. Yeah. So obviously we have a lot of inputs coming into our lives, uh, but somebody like Napoleon equally had massive amounts of mail coming to him on a daily basis, and he had an interesting way of curbing what he had to actually respond to. Yeah, so he, he was notorious for delaying opening the mail. So he would, he would like to run a lag time of a couple weeks. And the point was, by the time I open this letter, most of the things have resolved themselves already, right? Like, someone's writing this urgent letter, so-and-so might do this, or they might do this. Well, three weeks later, they've either done it or they haven't, right? And so he, he, was, he, was trying to, he was trying to let things sort through themselves. And then the other part of it, which I actually think is, is interesting too, he'd be like, wake me up with bad news, but not good news, you know? And the point was like, people would rush in and they'd be like, we're winning, and he'd be like, okay, I'm gonna go back to sleep, you know, <laughs> or whatever. Like, yeah. you don't need to wake me up with news that the plan succeeded because there's nothing I'm going to do with this information. But if things are teetering on the brink of failure, maybe there's something I can do about it. And so it's, it's you know, interesting how many emails I get from, you know, project, yes, it, it confirmed, we're on for two o'clock, and it's like, we already confirmed this. So this is an email telling me something I already know. You know, where it's like an Amazon delivery receipt. I'll either be there at the front door mm -hmm. and see that it's there or I won't see that it's there. Like how much of the communication that we let get all the way to us is telling us information that we're not going to take an action on. Do you have any Napoleon-esque tactics that you use for email in order to, whether it's either scheduling the email yeah. or using certain apps to make sure that, you know, don't get swept up in email and stuck eight hours a day checking. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple, so I don't, I, my new thing is I don't touch my phone for the first hour of the day. So I go to bed at whatever time, and then I wake up, I don't, I have a young kid, so I don't need an alarm. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I don't check my phone until one hour after whatever time that is. Not like I check my phone and then I take a one hour break, mm -hmm. but that it's, I'm adding one hour to however many hours I've slept. So that went from, you know, I've, I now do like this big break on my phone and, and I started with 10 minutes, I went to 15, I went to 30 and then, you know, now it's, it's, it's well over an hour. I can do, sometimes it'll be like, it's noon and I haven't checked my phone, you know? Um, I like to do that and then the other thing I do is like, if I get basically any email, because you probably get this too, you get very nice unsolicited notes from people. Hey, do you want to be on my podcast? Hey, do you want to come to this thing? You know, or, or hey, like, have you ever heard of this book? You should check it out. Or they're like, hey, can you help me with this problem? And I, I'm obviously so flattered to get this, and you work your whole life uh, to go from nobody to the kind of person that does get mail. So I don't take it for granted, um, and I don't resent it, but I know I will not do, be able to continue to do the thing that put me in the position to get those fans in the first place if I spend all my time answering mail. So I just, I mark them as red and then I star them. And then like tonight I'm flying, I have a three hour flight. I'll just open up my computer. I don't, I don't uh, ever buy Wi-Fi on planes just because I want no connected time. And then I just respond to those emails. And uh, you know, I might do a hundred in, in you know, three hours. And then uh, the people are never like, how could you have taken so long? Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, thanks. I never thought you'd reply at all. And that, that was really educational for me because I basically realized um, people send emails with no expectation of response. And I do that. I send emails, I read some book from some amazing person, I send them a note. I'm not, not only not hurt that they didn't respond, I like, unless they respond, I totally forgot that I even sent it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so it's like the pressure is not from the sender. The pressure is in my head, I made it up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I, I like what you said just about even just creating a rule. And I think when we're kids, people like we we hated rules. Whether it was like don't yeah. run with scissors or you have to finish your homework before you can eat dinner, you it, it was very frustrating. It almost felt like it was a, a restraint on our free will. But then as adults, you realize that that maybe our parents were right, and maybe it was good to have a little bit because it's so difficult to have self control for ourselves. Sure. But by setting up these rules, like okay, I'm only going to check email twice a day, or I'm not going to check my phone, not going to check screens in bed, then we're naturally setting up a limit because our brains don't know any better. And it's, it, sure. does, it takes, it's so easy for us to eventually develop these really bad habits. Well, look, uh, not to make this too much about you know, military generals, but like Eisenhower, he had this line, he said, um, uh, freedom is better defined as the opportunity for self-discipline. So it's like, 
you, you can have dessert before dinner. You know, like you can do all the things your parents didn't used to let you do. Um, and you, it, maybe it's fun to do that for a little while and then you quickly realize that that's not fun. And you have to go, okay, what order am I going to construct in my life? And, and I think one of the people that helped me with this is Cal Newport. Um, and he was, he was talking about this in digital minimalism is he's saying like, look, um, you sit down to, to eat a meal with someone and they have all sorts of dietary rules that they live by. They're like, I don't eat meat. I don't do dairy. I do gluten. You know, like they don't, they, they I'm doing Whole30 today. And, you know, like we have rules and we totally respect the individual's prerogative to decide how they're going to consume food. And then it just seems ridiculous to us, though, that like someone would have rules about their technology. And like technology to me seems like one way to place out, but like just have rules for your life. Like this is the routine that I follow. These are the things I do and these are the things that I don't do. Because like, uh, and William James talked about this in this, Abbey, this, this article he wrote on habits. He was just saying, was like, the person who has to decide everything anew each day is an exhausted, miserable person. You want to be able to know in it. You want to be able to pre-make as many decisions as possible. So then you can really think about the important decisions. A lot of times we tell ourselves this story that if we accomplish more, make more money, have more success, uh, have more girlfriends, <laughs> yeah. then we'll, we'll finally be happy. Like we'll yeah. finally get to this place where we will be fulfilled and have the life that we were after. Uh, what they call is it wrong? conditional happiness? Right. I'll be happy when these conditions. Yeah, are it's happy. like an if-then statement, and yeah. like I've certainly fallen into those traps myself. Where it's like, if I get this lens, then finally my videos will be perfect. If I get fifteen thousand subscribers, then I'll never have to worry about anything again. Um, is if this I just, just like, get written about in the New York Times, my yep. career will be made. And then even if you get those things, you know, if you're lucky enough to get those things, then you realize that okay, life just goes back to normal and then you still have problems. <laughs> what is it about this like fallacy, this idea of continually going after more? Uh, how do we rewire our thinking to make sure that we don't get caught up in that trap? I, it, it's definitely one of those things I think you have to experience at least once or twice because the whole idea of like money will not make you happy is a really cruel thing to say to someone who doesn't have any money. Mm -hmm. um, but I wish them the good fortune to have the money and then realize that it only addresses like a very small fraction of why they were unhappy or, or and so it's look it's very important to have goals and it's very important to always try to be improving and to get better and grow and do new and bigger and better things the problem is is when we think that accomplishing those things will be life-changing because at the end of the day they're still you like what i say in the book is you can't fix internal issues with external accomplishments. Um, uh, there is nowhere in history is there any conqueror or you know, creative or, or, or politician who is suddenly made whole by becoming president or you know, winning a war or winning an award, right? Like it just never happens. It, what, what you realize, you realize two things when you accomplish the things you set out to do. One, it doesn't feel nearly as good as you thought it would. And two, your mind is already moving the goalposts po towards another thing. So that it, it would be like if we realize like, hey, you know, having a million dollars isn't as transformative as you think it is, that would be one thing. The problem is we go, we don't go, okay, lesson learned not going to do that we go ah two million dollars <laughs> you know like yeah. we go or oh or oh uh new york times bestseller list my problem was i didn't hit number one you know or whatever it is and so it's just it's this fallacy you will not be made happy by external things you will it will no amount of doing will fill any hole in your soul or in your being, do you know what I mean? And and I'm not. I'm again. I'm not saying, oh, go go to therapy so you can work out all these things and then don't have any ambition. What I'm saying is like, can we actually get to a place where we're doing things for the right reasons? Like I'm writing a book to because I think it's important because it's uh, you know I value excellence because um, you know I, I enjoy the process 
et cetera, et cetera, not am I writing a book because I want to make my parents proud of me. Like if your parents aren't proud of you, there's nothing like naturally proud of you, there's nothing you can do that's going to win that affection. Because by the way, it was never yours to win. You know what I mean? Like you, you earned it at birth and they've just decided not to give it to you. And, and the same goes with, you know, there, there's no amount of, of beautiful men or women that were, are going to make you feel good about yourself if you don't feel good about yourself. There's no amount of beautiful vacations to far-flung destinations. And in fact, one of the worst, most insidious myths is this idea of like, oh, I hate my job, I hate where I am. If I can just uh, save up enough money and travel the world, then I'll be happy and fulfilled. It's like, guess who's going along for that ride? You know? <laughs> right, just an escape. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of people, and there's a lot of movies, and a lot of people are talking about happiness and trying to find happiness. But is there also an inherent contradiction to chasing happiness and always trying to seek happiness? Because yes. it presupposes that you aren't happy and you aren't content. Is that in the same way, this chasing after something, sure. when we could simply be happy with what we have? Viktor Frankl uh, survived multiple concentration camps, one of the most brilliant psychologists of the 20th century. He was like, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And I think stillness is a similar concept. You don't go achieve stillness. You set up conditions in which stillness is possible. And you have to have the humility and the, um, the tolerance to know that happiness and stillness is fleeting. It's ephemeral. You get it for chunks of time and then it goes away and then it comes back. Do you know what I mean? That like nobody is happy all the time. Nobody is still all the time. Uh, but there are definitely people who are never happy and never still. And so the first step is let's not do what those people are doing. Isn't that the greatest challenge of like anything when it comes to self-development is the act of continuing a practice, whether it's practicing stoicism or stillness, like how do we make sure it's a daily practice and it's not something like a gym habit that we get really fired up in the moment, but then a month goes by and we never go to the gym. Well, we have this idea even with reading. It's like, oh, I read that book, you know, or like, oh, I know what that is. And it's like, actually in the ancient world, philosophy was a practice. When you look at a book like Meditations, which is Marcus Aurelius' sort of only text, um, we go, oh, there's contradictions in there, or oh, he repeats himself a lot, or oh, like it seems a little depressing, or whatever. It's because it's not for you, it's for him. This is the most powerful man in the world in the mornings, or at the palace, or in the evening, on, you know, in his tent when he's on, uh, you know, waging wars. He's, he's practicing the philosophy that he knows. He's writing to himself Hey, remember when you lost your temper earlier? Here's why that's a bad idea. You know how you were letting your ego creep in? Not a good idea. You know, he's, he's reminding himself of the things that he's read and studied. And actually, when you really get into Stoicism, you realize like there's almost nothing original in meditations, that you can trace it back to books he read. It's almost like meditations is his book of quotes. And so it's, it's realizing that this philosophy or, or even minimalism or the principles of minimalism or, or, or just any of the things we're studying and learning about, whether it's Buddhism or Christianity or, or whatever it is, it's not this thing you do one time. You check it out and then you got it. It's, it's, it's a skill, it's a practice, it's an activity that you do. You split the book into three sections, mind, body, and soul. And there are a few characters in the film from Michael Jordan to, uh, there was a couple others, what was it, uh, Tiger Woods? Yes. That they're kind of like these uh, warnings to people to not simply put all your eggs in one basket. Don't simply just focus on your mind or your body or just your soul. Why is that so? Why is it so important to have that balance of all three? And why are those three the keys? Sure. I mean, look, someone like Tiger Woods clearly had enormous mental discipline. He was a assassin on the golf course. This is a, a physical discipline too. I mean, you don't get that good at something if you haven't practiced it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. I mean, Tiger Woods can stop his swing mid swing. Like, if you think about the hand eye coordination that, that requires. And yet, uh, spiritually was, cl- and I don't mean in a Christian or a Buddhist sense, I just mean like his soul was clearly aching in an incredible amounts of pain. You don't, you don't uh, do what he did and you don't find yourself on 19 consecutive covers of the New York Post if everything's all right inside, you know? 
And, uh, and, and so it's, it's about realizing that just because you get rid of all your stuff and you adopt a minimalist lifestyle, that doesn't mean you're still, you know what I mean? Like I, I would rather someone have, you know, uh, a lot of stuff, but not spend their time comparing themselves to other people than someone to sell all their possessions, you know, hit the road, but, but spend all their time on Instagram, you know, pretending they're, they're better than other people. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. or, 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 you know, constantly getting in conflict with other people. Like you can be uh, physically still and, 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 and mentally a mess. You can be mentally still and, and uh, you know, emotionally bankrupt. There's so, so many different ways to do it. The idea is you gotta attack it from all these different angles. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist monk, he's saying like, uh, on the surface of the ocean, there, it can seem like there's stillness, but beneath there's currents. And so really the book is about how do we address those currents? Because like, how many people are able to go off into the, a cabin in the woods, they've reduced all external noise, and then they find the noises in here. You know, the, the noise is that voice in their head that won't shut up, it's not their coworkers. How do we address that voice in the head? How do we, how do we <laughs> confront it? Uh, it, because it can certainly be painful. I actually did 30 days of meditation this year where I sat down for an hour each day, not all in the same yeah. sitting, <laughs> broken up over the day, I'm not a maniac, but it was still a very difficult process and mm-hmm. you certainly, you, it's just uncomfortable. You always just want to check the clock, check the watch and make sure, sure. Like, when am I done? When can I actually do something? Um, how do we embrace that kind of stillness? And also, I guess there's the other kind of stillness too where you talked about in the book, like baseball players have less than a fraction of a second to hit a baseball, yeah. or the, the archer who's trying to hit bullseye, they have to not think. Uh, do these, are, is this, are these stillnesses the same kind of thing? Or I think, is it- I think there, are, there are different forms of the same idea. I mean, I love what you said, which is like, okay, you wanted to have more stillness and inner peace in your life, so what did you do? You worked at it. You know what I mean? I think people go like, yeah, I want that. And okay, if you wanted to lose 10 pounds, you don't just think it, you have to go make changes in your life. Um, And those changes can be, hey, I'm gonna, you know, stop negative thought patterns, or it can be, hey, I'm gonna start taking an hour walk every day, or it can be, hey, I'm gonna go to therapy to deal with this trauma that happened to me when I was 11 that I've been just sort of stuffing down, right? Or, or, um, you know, maybe it's it's like, look, the reason you're having stillness is because you're lonely, and so you're gonna go out and, you know, sort of actively cultivate some relationships, right? Or, or you're gonna, th- there's all these different things that we can attack it from. But the idea is that, I, I think it's really important that we don't mistake stillness with idleness and nothingness, right? Like, a baseball player needs stillness because they're doing a diff- very difficult thing. If uh, Yogi Berra said you can't think and hit at the same time, like, if they're, if they're up there at the plate thinking about how much money they're making, if they're thinking about what the crowd's thinking, if they're holding on to some resentment from their coach, if they're trying to prove somebody wrong, if they're still stewing on a fight they had with their spouse the night before, they are not going to be as good at the very difficult thing that they're doing. You think about someone like uh, John F. Kennedy in the Cuban Missile Crisis, like here you have a guy, literally the, the fate of the world is on his shoulders. It's he should be thinking about that, right? It's not that he should be thinking about nothing. He's got to really take the time to stop and think very deeply about what's at stake, what all the factors at play are. You know, like what you see in, in Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, on the one hand, there's a lot of interesting kinds of stillness. Like he, sw- he goes swimming in the White House pool. He takes these long walks through the, the White House Rose Garden. And yet he's also going hey, why would the Russians have done this? Like, what's their motivation? And no one had really, like, it's amazing, but no one had asked this question. And then, and then he goes, okay, so my generals are advising that I do X. And he's like, what will the Russians do in response to X? And the generals are like, well, that's not our concern. And it's like, of course it is, you know? And so, so I, we can think because Buddhism talks about things like emptying the mind, or you know, slowing down your thoughts, that it's about not thinking at all. I think it's really about making space for the really important kind of thinking that we need to do. A lot of people that talk about minimalism, 
uh, talk about the idea that it's not about deprivation, it's not about getting rid of things that you truly love and value. Yeah. But then there's a, the stoic idea that I really love of testing yourself and going without something for sure. say the course of a month, depriving yourself of the good foods that you typically eat. Sure. Uh, how do you view that idea? Is that something that you practice yourself? Do you find it helpful to uh, go without, especially even if it's something that you actually value and love? Sure. I mean, my, in my the way I try to live my life is to be in charge of what I do or don't do. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I decide what I eat, what I don't eat, you know, I, or I might go, hey, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm gonna run further than my body wants me to. Like, I wanna be in charge. Do you know what I mean? And I, I wanna build that as a muscle. Because there's all sorts of times in life when you have to override those feelings. Like, think about what an emotion like courage is. Cur- if we call it an emotion, but courage is not the absence of fear, it's the rising above the fear. So if you're a kind of person who has not built much experience or muscle or power in the ability of overriding, those emotions, you're gonna have trouble doing that when things count, you know? And and so I I do think it's about it, it's about putting yourself in a position where you are able to keep an even keel no matter what happens. So when Seneca is talking about, you know, practicing deprivation, or Marcus Aurelius is sleeping on a hard mattress, it's not that the it's not that the deprivation itself is a virtue. That like not being poor is not an impressive thing. I mean, literally anyone can do it, right? Like, so why would that be impressive, right? To just not have things is not impressive. What it is about is about the preparation for a contingency, or it's about putting yourself in a position where you are not anxious about losing what you have because you know you can handle that thing. So like um, being a comedian is obviously on the one hand, it's about being funny, but it's in the other, it's the ability to get up on stage and deal with the uncertainty of you don't know how it's gonna go. And to continue to be able to do that. Like, a comedian has the ability to be on stage and bomb. I do not have that ability. Like, if I went up on stage and people started booing me, I would be destroyed. Do you know what I mean? Because that's not a thing I've practiced, really, and I don't have, I mean, I would hope I'd not be destroyed, but you get what I mean, like, do you have to- You'd be destroyed, probably. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, like, I do spend time on stage, right. and I have dealt with yeah. tough audiences, but I just mean, like, that's not, that's not a contingency I sort of actively prepare for, but I do actively prepare for what happens if a book doesn't do well, or what happens if you get a bad review, or if you, what happens if you get a really angry email from someone, and I do try to think about you know, I think one of the one of the unintended benefits of minimalism and the sort of uh, fire movement is it's a it's an insulation from the fact that you don't control the economy. It could melt down tomorrow. You could lose your job. You could find out your your uh, you know your savings went down by half. Like, but if you're a person who can only live at the level you're currently living at you are much more vulnerable to those swings of fate than a person who says, uh, I can do less than that. Like, so Cleanthes, he's the, the Stoic who comes after Zeno. And the fact, um, Zeno used to joke that Cleanthes was so frugal, he could support another Cleanthes. Mm-hmm. Like that, that he, he was like, he, he, only, he only needed half of what he had. And I think that's like an interesting rule. You know what I mean? Like, could you could your income go down by half tomorrow? Could you make do with half as much house? Um, the answer is obviously yes, because unless you were born with those things, you made do with half of it for probably more time than you've had twice it. But right, like if you're searching for contentment in a lot of ways, it starts with asking that question: How much is enough for yeah. you? How much do we actually need? And I know "enough" is one of those words that words that comes up over and over again in the book. Yeah, it's interesting. Tiger Woods' dad called "enough" the E word, and it should be it shouldn't surprise us then that there was never enough for Tiger Woods, um, and that there's not enough for a lot of people. And, and what my favorite story in the book is probably a story of Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller, the, the two authors of Catch-22 and Slaughterhouse-Five, they're at, the party, they're at a party of this billionaire. And the billionaire is very, very successful. Everyone knows who he is, probably in finance, he doesn't say. But Kurt Vonnegut starts making fun of Joseph Heller. It's like, you know, how does it feel to know that this guy probably made more money this week than Catch-22, one of the great books in all of American literature, 
will make in its lifetime. And Joseph Heller goes, yeah, but I have something that this guy doesn't have. And, and Kurt Vonnegut says, what's that? And he says, I know what enough is. And you realize that enough isn't like uh, weak. It's not settling. It's actually an extreme form of power. There's a, one of the great stories in, in all of probably the ancient world is, is Diogenes, the, the cynic. He's, uh, you know, he's laying there sunbathing and Alexander the Great comes up to him, you know, the most powerful man in the world. And he's heard of this guy and he's like, hey, what can I do for you? Like in the way that, you know, we think powerful people are trying to control us, but like sometimes they want to offer us things. And um, there's nothing that he can give Diogenes. Diogenes just says, yes, you can stop blocking the sun because he was standing over him. And you realize, like, who's really more powerful? Is it uh, Alexander the Great who needs this guy's approval? Or is it Diogenes the philosopher who has made himself so independent that there's nothing he wants or needs that he doesn't have? Well, Ryan, thanks so much for doing this. The book is called Stillness is the Key. Uh, amazing job with the book. Thank I'm really you. excited. Thanks for doing this, dude. Of course. Um, who's that? It's, uh, it's Ryan Holiday. I, uh, I just did an interview with him. Well, it was like three hours ago, and yeah, he won't leave? He's, it like, he's just staring. He's still. Still. 